Okay, we're going to talk today about um, growing research equity and representation, and this is a dialogue with Latin American researchers and um, one of our journalist colleagues from SciDev.net as well. Um, I'm from the Elsevier Foundation, from Elsevier. You may have heard of our um, organization, the publishers. So before we start, um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about gender in research and why we're um, talking about this today. A couple of points from our own research that we've done about gender in science. And um, we found that while in terms of the number of publications, things are improving and women are getting nearer to parity with men, um, especially among younger authors, there's more parity. It's only in Argentina where parity has actually been achieved. With regard to patents, this is very, very slow. Um, there are very slow improvements with far fewer women, 20 to 100 men getting patents. And um, when it comes to citations, there's the same quality between men and women, but nowhere near the same quantity. So we know that that's for other reasons like maternity leave and career um, leave, not the quality of work. So, and we know that over the course of 10 years, publications really drop for women. So we wanted to talk today about what we can do to um, understand the barriers to women in research and also what the media can do to approach that differently and really make a difference to uh, giving voice and visibility to women in research. So I wanted to introduce everybody on the panel. So again, my name is Rebecca Clear. I work for the Elsevier Foundation. We are um, a charitable arm of the Elsevier um, Scientific Publishing House and Data Analytics Company. And the Elsevier Foundation works very hard to challenge inequity in research and health through partnerships with other organisations. And one of the things that we do is um, offer awards um, in conjunction with um, the Organisation for Women in Science of Developing Countries to give awards to women who are really growing in their fields in science. And with me, I've got three award winners of that OZ and Elsevier Foundation Award. And also, as I mentioned, my colleague Louisa Masarani from SciDev. So to my left is um, Dr. Magali Blas. Um, and then next to her is Dr. Carly Crespo Melgar. And then we have Dr. Gabriela Montenegro. And they're all going to talk about their research. And first of all, I'd just like to ask them to introduce um, the, uh, a little bit about their research. And then we're going to talk about um, what gender has meant in their, in their fields. So can I turn to Dr. Magali Blas first to tell us a little bit about your work and perhaps the, the um, gender element in that research as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's the first time I am here at the World Science Journalism, which is exciting. Uh, communications is a very important part of scientific research that many times scientific don't take into account. So my name is Magali Blas. I am a physician from Cayetano Heredia Peruvian University in Lima, Peru. And I did my master's in public health and my PhD in epidemiology at the University of Washington in Seattle. I am currently an associate professor at the School of Public Health at Cayetano Heredia and an affiliate associate professor at the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. So I became in love with research when I was in the fourth year of medical school and we were sent to the Amazon to do a project to decrease anemia among children under five years old. And then I became in love of uh, the, the Amazon and research. So when I finished my PhD, I decided I will go and I will return to the Amazon. So I started to do research on infectious diseases, especially, specifically the human papilloma virus and the human T-lymphotropic virus in those areas, until I became pregnant with my two daughters while working in the field in areas that didn't have access to water, electricity, or sanitation. So at that point, pregnant, I think I was able to see more clear all the huge inequities that exist for women in the Amazon to access any type of healthcare and any basic services. So I decided, no, I will switch my career path and I will now work to improve maternal and newborn health in remote, rural, and indigenous areas of the Peruvian Amazon. And that is, that is how I started Mamas de Rio. So I received a call for applications from Grand Challenges Canada and the Peruvian Council of Science and Technology, and they were looking for bold ideas. So I decided to apply to that grant, and I started the Mamas de Rio, which means in English, Mothers of the River, which is a program that trains community health workers in the use of technology 
to display educational content of mothers and families, but also to gather health data that can be sent to decision makers so that they can make important decisions about their life of these women. So we also train, of course, traditional birth attendants, healthcare personnel, and perform community sensitization. We started that program, which is an implementation research in 2015. We are now eight years on this journey. And we did first, for, of course, formative research. We piloted the intervention. We redid the program. We conducted an evaluation of the program. And we finally have the results. That is basically that Mamas de Rio, or Mothers of the River, improves almost all essential newborn care outcomes, which means early breastfeeding, skin-to-skin -skin contact, providing the colostrum to the newborns, among other outcomes. So now my journey as a researcher hasn't ended. No? It will end there by giving presentations in scientific uh, conferences or by publishing, but no, I decided that this time I will go until the end. So we are working with indigenous communities to make Mothers of the River a public policy in Peru, which is super hard. No? It's more complicated than doing the design of the program and the evaluation. And that is why I think communication now is super, super important to us. Thank you. Well, um, nice meeting you, everybody. My name is Carla Crespo. I'm Bolivian. I'm a biochemist. I have a degree, a PhD degree in biotechnology. I've been studying in Sweden, doing my, my PhD, and I went back to my country and now working at my university, is uh, Universidad Mayor de San Andres in La Paz, Bolivia. There, as a researcher, I focus on the potential application of beneficial microorganisms, just yes, those ones that live in the soil. Um, as a strategy to improve uh, sustainable agriculture um, as a crucial step for alleviating hunger. I'm investigating in this native uh, diversity of the soil uh, because I come from a rich country with extreme environments. So there we, we look for microorganisms as a strategy to improve crop productivity basically by just adding microorganisms to the, to the production, to the, to the soil, and uh, have this as a resilience alternative against drought, against frost, which are uh, very bad conditions, product of the climate change. Uh, we work in arid ecosystems, for instance, uh, in quinoa production in the southern altiplain of Bolivia. Uh, we also work with microbes and controlling mm, microbial diseases in crops, which is a problem derived from the climate change. Um, we are now at the moment of developing protocols for producing these biopesticides, bio um, fertilizers, bio inoculants in Bolivia and the region. And it's, it's a challenge because we are exploring a way to um, produce these bio-inputs locally. So we are not dependent anymore in, in the export, importing products. And we want to do it locally with indigenous communities and small companies. Uh, we are in the process of validating this technology and the application protocols so that in the medium term we can assure uh, food security and sovereignty in my country. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I feel very honored to be with such a wonderful and inspiring woman in this panel. And also, uh, I'm kind of privileged to have such a public. Um, I've never been with um, science, I mean, um, journalism in science, which is the fourth power, like in Guatemala say. They say, and by the way, Bridget, thank you. I love the, the, the starting of this, this um, conference, so I'm sure this is going to be a very nice conference. Uh, I'm Gabriela Montenegro. I am a nutritionist from Guatemala, and I have a master in, in public health, international public health, and a PhD in um, nutrition from Germany. I work currently, I'm finishing one uh, project which is named Sacmolo, which means egg in Kachikel language. Uh, Guatemala has the worst indicators from Latin American health for children. 
So um, what I work is, um, right now we're finishing this large randomized control trial to see the effect of adding one egg to the, dietary, to the diet of small children in development and growth. But I'm finishing this project now and I'm starting another one, which is um, knowing the effect as well, but for the aflatoxin in corn, you know, Guatemala has, corn is like the base staple. And we believed that this has somehow an effect on long and, and linear growth, in, in general growth. So what, what I like, what I'm passionate about is finding other uh, nutrition determinants more than food. And when I was hearing uh, the first conference, I was just, yes, I would like to. This is what I wanted to say, you know, but she did it perfectly. And what I'm saying is that one size doesn't fit all. So we're doing, what we're trying to do is like how to adapt the, the, this, um, let's say the, the, the mandatos, the, 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 the references, the guidelines, how do we adapt them to the context, in Guatemalan context. So this is what I'm working and I'm very happy to be here and I hope this uh, conference, this panel is useful for you. So I, uh, good morning, everyone. I am Luisa Mazzarani from Brazil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in this panel with this, uh, such inspiring women and this uh, joint effort with SFDA and SciDev.net. So I, am, uh, I have a, a degree in journalism. I have a, a master in science information and a doctorate in uh, biochemistry. And the reason for that is because it's the way that we in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, we can have a PhD in, in science communication. And the reason that I wanted to do uh, a, a doctorate in science communication or in biochemistry is because uh, I was working uh, since very young in science journalism and I really wanted to understand further what means to communicate, to engage with different sectors of the society. So that's why I, I wanted to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So uh, I work for SciDev.net, which is, if you don't know, I strongly invite you to visit us in our website website, we have a stand in some place there, is a beautiful initiative because it's about science in the global south and I, I am the coordinator of Latin America and I think that's really important for us to have this website because we know a lot about what is going on in science in the United States and Europe and we know very little what is going on in our region. So uh, having information about science of our countries in our language is very important including for uh, um, pushing some collaborations and some, uh, I mean, visibility for the science of in our countries. So I think that that is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And I think it's really interesting following on from Bridget's um, fascinating keynote that we're talking about Global South and at that colonialism and the way that um, women particularly can portray what they're doing and get their research heard. So I think it's really important that we're talking about this today. Um, I'd just like to start by with a very simple question, probably not with a simple answer, <laughs> um, and just turning to each of you in turn. Um, what has it, what has it meant, um, Magali, being a, um, a woman, how has that affected your career so far? And what have your experiences been given your different contexts and the, particularly the field of research you're working in, but also where you're working? So being a woman working in science, um, so the influence, I will say the effect, or it, it's different depending on the context. Like for example, when I was at the university at Cayetano Heredia, I think it was like being in a bubble. No, it's, it was like a perfect world for me, in the sense that my mentor was a woman. She was the first dean of the School of Public Health, the first head of the National Institute of Health. Then she became the Minister of Health. Uh, we had the first rector who was a woman. So I think I have several role models, and actually I, I saw being a woman like something empowering. However, when I went into the field to work in Amazonian areas, the situation was different. The majority of women are housewife. Um, and I had to deal like as a principal investigator with men basically, you know. Men are the ones who rule in the Amazonian setting and they are not used to see a female leader and less a doctor. So. The challenge was not only being a woman, 
leading a project in Amazonian context, but also coming from a medical field. As you know, indigenous communities have been traditionally neglected from the government, and they don't rely on the health system that where we work. So they are reluctant actually to go to health facilities. They say, if you go to a health facility, you will die. So it was an additional challenge for me. I learned a lot about cultural humility. Sometimes I had an interchange with an indigenous person who told me, you are not a doctor, I am the doctor, because I know about traditional medicine, you don't know about that. So I have learned a lot along the years. We have now eight years with them of a beautiful relationship. We are now fighting for, for the same rights, no? that is that women in rural areas access to healthcare services in the Amazon. So I am fighting from the university, dealing with the government, and they have created, and I am proud of that, the first indigenous association of community health workers in the Amazon called ACOSIL, and they are fighting for the same rights from their position. So we are fighting together to achieve that. So I would say it will depend on the context, being a woman, but also being a woman and a mother helped me to design and think how can I improve the health of women who live in rural areas? I would say that I wouldn't have that experience of becoming a mother. Probably I will never design Mamas de Rio or Mothers of the River. Uh, so that was very important, and I think that's where my passion goes. No? As I mentioned before, as a traditional researcher, maybe I will end my research in the publication or on the presentation of my research. But now, this time, I want to go until the end, which is to make Mamas de Rio my project, the project with whom I work with indigenous people for so many years, a public policy in Peru. And also I want to mention that we were able to expand our program to Colombia. Actually, we're working in the border between Peru and Colombia, thanks to funding from the Ministry of External Affairs and the Inter-American Development Bank. So now we are two countries, Peru and Colombia, who are fighting for the inclusion of community health workers from rural areas in the formal health system of our countries. You. Carlo, could you tell us a little bit about the barriers that you've faced and, and what it's meant for you? Well, from my point of view, being a woman in science, it has two kind of impacts, negative and positive impacts. From the positive side, I can say that being a woman and a young woman at the university puts me in, in a privileged position of, of a role model for my students, for other young um, professionals that are pursuing a um, scientific career. So I see myself represent, uh, representing them. I've um, tried to motivate them, and now I'm in the position to give them opportunities to, to follow a, a scientific career, especially while directing um, international collaboration programs. We work a lot with the Swedish collaboration, and we train uh, PhD students. So it's, it's an opportunity to include um, bright people, bright women, young women, to continue a career and perhaps to be the future scientist at, uh, at my country, at my university. So I identify with them. I also identify with the ones that come from far away because I used to live like two hours far away from my university. And I, I, I see them, I see them as I was. Um, try to give them facilities. I also identify the ones that are um, younger mothers, uh, the ones that are um, perhaps in a low economical position at the moment. So I see um, a very positive impact for them, trying to be for them a, a role model, being a woman. Um, from the negative impacts, uh, from the negative effects, I can say that well, at the university and in the academia, as Magali said, we are trying to living in, in a bubble, <laughs> working with projects, trying to keep gender equity because it's a demand of the funders. So we try to, to have a gender balance inside. But when we go outside of the university and we go to rural areas where um, doing projects with these indigenous communities, originary people, have their own rules. Um, they have uh, their role models, um, which are male. Uh, their authorities are male uh, persons. 
And sometimes I believe working with them, the opinions and the suggestions or even the conclusions that we can achieve as a scientist could be neglected unless, unless we are supported by men you know, who are uh, leaders in these communities. I believe that although we try to keep gender balance uh, in the teams, we also have to include young people because they are not only the future, but they are the reflect and also other young people can decide to follow a scientific career um, sometimes, but the negative aspect of that is that sometimes working in these rural communities affect the confidence of these young people, especially young ladies, because they see uh, how they are ruled and what, how important is the role of, of male and how neglected are the women, although they have very big responsibilities and perhaps the women are doing more work in their communities than the male do. So I had to deal with these both aspects, negatives and positives, and try to make a balance and try to be a role model for them and trying to inspire also, not just people from the university, but also people from the rural areas, so they can decide to study and contribute with their communities. Thank you. Have you had a similar experience, Gabriela? Very similar, but somehow. Um, I have an interesting back background. I um, come from a matriarchal family, so since a young age, I know that women were the power. But in real life, it was different. So I went first to biomed engineering tech, and we were four women and 20 men in USA. So because I was ready like to, to, to make my voice and be myself, I had not so much problems. Then I come to nutrition, which is traditionally a female uh, career. Then we were like four men and 45 women. So open the way in, and for me it was very interesting because when I was in the male world, I was more respected. When I was in the female world, where I had to compete more with the same females. So it was a, di a different approach. And, uh, but after all, interestingly, my best mentors were men. And they wanted to push in me to speak out and say, Gabriela, you can. And, and this was very, this somehow shaped again my, my research areas and my career because they were more, they, were, they believed in me, like, um, okay, I believed in me, but they were like pushing me more into uh, spaces where no other female were. So for me, it has been very positive to be a woman. But in my work, especially because, like I said, you know, nutrition is very traditional, given for a woman. So, for example, I can feel the empathy uh, when I go to communities and I talk to women. I can understand, and they can talk to me different things, not just food. We finished being like psychologists for this uh, uh, rural woman, but also, you know, like in the negative still that Guatemala is very hostile, Host hostile, rude. It's a country root. It's a root country. So we just don't fight because we are women, but we are fighting against inequities in other and everything, right? It's stigmas. So it's very complicated, uh, let's say. But I have hope that this is our moment as well because we have seen advances. The fact that we are here and thank you to Saida for organizing this is because we are giving a voice. So it's time for us like to step out and inspire other girls that are coming uh, behind us. So as I said, I, I come from Brazil, and Brazil is one of the fewest countries in the world that actually is 50% uh, women, 50% uh, men in the scientific community. The issue is uh, the positions of power and also the, the balance in some fields. There are some fields that actually are uh, a lot of men and a few women, and also other fields that there are much more women than men. So I think that this is important to pay attention and have a more balance in terms of gender. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, science journalism, actually it seems that it's a, a kind of slightly more women than men. So I think that I'm facing a different situation. It's, um, you mentioned about the media and do you, do you think, starting with you Louisa, do you think that the media understands the gender perspective? So the things that some of our colleagues here have talked about um, so when the reporting on science and related issues, do you think that 
those questions are asked enough about the gender perspective of science and research? Yeah, one of the things that's important for us to remember and in a, a conference uh, of science journalists is, is, uh, is a kind of obvious is that there are different uh, types and kinds of media, right? So it's, it's not possible to generalize, generalize. There are some media that put a lot of attention and others not. But in general, uh, we, we observe and we have been doing some studies on that. We see that uh, usually there are more men scientists being interviewed than women. And also when there are women, uh, usually uh, they, they have less time for uh, in, during the interview. It's uh, less time of voice, let's say. And uh, we inside that we put a lot of attention about uh, uh, gender, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, when we are going to interview someone, we try to do a balance between men and women. Uh, but uh, besides that, uh, also to, to think about image of men and women in an interesting way, not only putting women in, a, in this stereotype position of women, trying to put a woman as a scientist, as men are scientists. So we, we try to, to give voice to and to present an image in an interesting way and in a more, uh, a less stereotype way of, um, of uh, uh, presenting women. Another aspect that we think, if you allow me, Rebecca, is to that we, we think that's very important. Uh, obviously, there are women who are senior scientists which is very important to, to give voice for them, but also to give voice for younger uh, women and men scientists and also uh, uh, other sectors of the society. We have in Latin America a society with a lot of indigenous people, black people, and also to put uh, image that uh, uh, science is for everyone, not only for white people. So I think that's very important to express uh, in image uh, when we publish. Thank you. And um, Magali, you mentioned about making, you, you know, your ambition being to make Mamas del Rio a public policy. Um, what sort of things would you like the media to be asking when you're talking about your research to really bring out the gender perspective in your work? I mean, what, what is the challenge with media for you now? Well, I think it's, and I have to acknowledge that several times as researchers, we focus on reporting to our funders to the other scientific community, but we don't communicate that outside, I mean, for general audiences. And I think that is something that we need to learn that is super important. But basically, I will say that we want to press the government. That is what we want to do with the media. We want to press it because I have, I have been, I am, I not, I would say I am not tired, but I have talked like for many years, I would say I have given like several presentations to several persons in the government about our program. But I think the people who make decisions, they sometimes they react when there is like a fire. If there is not like it's not a fire, then they will just go on with the status quo. So I will say, of course, we want to make visible our work. We have done some press releases of our. Um, initial research. Now that we have the final results of Mothers of the River program that show that community health workers in rural areas improve the health of newborns in those areas that don't have access to any health care, I think, of course, we are going to not only publish it, we are some, several publications in scientific journals, but we, are one, we want to do a press release that cites the publication in that journal that we have uh, publish on and I would say make a word so they, everybody knows how important is it. So of course we are talking with the government at several levels, regional, national, local, but we also need the community to fight for their rights and that is how through the work we have done which has been um, to advocate the, during the community and to empower the community. We have done our work using photo voice and storytelling so that people in the government be aware of all the fight that, or the work that community health workers have done during the pandemic. They presented, for example, uh, the pictures of their work using photo voice uh, in Lima, the Ministry of Health, and also in the regional government of Loreto, but they have formed this indigenous association of community health workers. So I think we're not only going to push 
from the government like us, but the community is also going to push that. Of course, the media is super important to communicate all our findings, what the communities think about the situation of the health there, what to advocate for the rights, and I think communications and media will be key in this next phase of our program. Yeah, and therefore you need to really make sure that they're interviewing the right people and are you finding that there are barriers when you talk to the media um, to get your voice heard or what's your experience been? I feel that there is not enough support from the universities for that. So, for example, like my university is big, they have a, a lot of I mean, research going on, but there is few efforts to put that on the media. So I, what I have to do, because I am tired of I mean, relying only on the university, is that from my projects, I have to set aside funding to hire a person, like a journalist. I, w I have to write my own, of course, uh, press release, because in other settings, like we have a publication recently in The Lancet with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and they have a team of people who translate your paper into a press release. We don't have that in Peru, so I, I will dream, but of course the press release is in English. So I have to set aside funding from my project, so that to hire a journalist, write my own press release, and uh, make it public, so the journalists can help me to have interviews um, with media. We have done that for the formative phase, now we're doing that for the, the paper that we just published in Lancet, and we're going to do that also for the outcome evaluation of our program. It's interesting that there's another part in the whole jigsaw puzzle. There's the universities as well and the support there or lack, lack of. So that's a really interesting perspective. Carla, have you had a similar experience? Or yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have to say that science communication in Bolivia is, is in diapers. <laughs> and it's our fault, actually. The fault of the scientists. The fault of the teams that do not challenge themselves to go outside. We are get used to presenting reports for the funders, but not presenting reports for the society, and it's our fault. We, don't speak, we do not speak in simple words sometimes, and we are just neglected. <laughs> but uh, also in my country, I believe there is this stereotype of, of a scientist, which is when you think on that, it's, it's a man, an old man, wise man, <laughs> Uh, with white hair, <laughs> and that is a scientist in my country. Well, at least that is the face of scientists. And this is just historical. Now, as a team, and I want to tell you an experience, I, I've been working very close to a team uh, composed by women, okay? Scientist women that were working in a community, in a rural community, doing something like Gabriela is doing, working with the nutrition in a community with some Andean crops. And media is there just when it's fire, when there, there is fire day or when there are parties there, like big celebrations that involve the authorities. And unfortunately, the authorities in my country are male, male authorities. They are the directors, they are the deans, the rectors at the university. And when one project had to be celebrated in a town, showing the achievements of this, of this project with the community in the nutritional area, uh, then the media is there. And the media is doing the interviews to the directors, to the deans, to the males, that of course are the authorities, but not the people who, who took the role and the responsibility to develop something for a community, which are women in most cases. And uh, we say that um, this is, the, the women work are like the ant work. They are, they are working behind and with everybody and working hard, but uh, suddenly for this stereotype, they are not covered by the reporters. So it's something bad, but of course it's our fault as a scientist too, because we do not um, communicate what are, who composed the team and what are the responsibilities of these people. So, yeah, it's something that we have to change in Bolivia. Uh, something mm, that I, I, I want to stress again is that uh, media should not cover just um, mm, scientifics, all, all scientifics, or uh, it should not cover also people who is learning, who is being trained on, on science, because this is the people who will 
then share more closely with their friends and perhaps motivate more even. And uh, I think that could be a strategy also to popularize science and to popularize the achievements and really visualize what we are getting out of the projects that are themselves very difficult to achieve in, 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 in the conditions of, I guess, our countries. Hmm? Magali, you wanted to respond to that and then I'll come to Gabriela. Yes, I want to add something that I know that as a female scientist, of course, we are responsible, but we have to also see the context. We are living in, we, in Latin America where women are overloaded with a lot of work in the family. And if you don't have kids, you have to take care also of your family members, your mother, your father. So as a female scientist, we don't escape from that. We have the majority of the burden in the house. No matter if you have a PhD or an MPH. And if you are divorced or a single mother, the burden is even higher. So I will say that um, a media not wants an answer like within one, one hour or within four hours. So we have to work on both sides. Of course, empower female scientists uh, on the media training and also the importance of communicating the findings, but also make the media more understanding of the situation in which we live. And I want to tell you something that happened to me. I, I received a call from a TV reporter that asked me if I can comment about the recent um, COVID pandemic and what the government in Peru is going to do. And I tell her, of course, no, <laughs> because he, she wanted the interview the next day in the morning and I have a lot of things to do with my kids. And she told me, Dr. Blas, you are the third woman I have called and have told me no. I know if I call a man, I will have 10 men talking tomorrow in the morning, but I want a female epidemiologist. So that made me think, oh, well, yes, it's true. That is also why I am seeing a lot of male epidemiologists talking about COVID in Peru. Because also as women, we don't find the time to do that. I know it's important, but also we need a societal change to be able to do that, if I will have someone to take care of my kids or to do something for me while I prepare for that interview, I mean, I can do things. But the thing is that for the media to understand is also important because going to a TV interview is not simple. No, it's not like I will just wake up and go. No, I have to read the context. Sometimes I haven't read news like for the, next, for the last two days. But I have to, to read the context, what is happening, why, why they will ask me, and I mean, things around that. So I will say that is also important um, to have a media understanding of our context and also to, to be able to balance, right? So understand that and balance. Okay, like, like this reporter that I love, a balance, no? Okay, I will try to find, even though it will cost me more, I will find a female science to answer that question. That's very interesting about the um, media and giving time, because we all know media is very time poor and every, everybody needs an answer very quickly. So I wonder if when we know that it's an advanced piece, we can give more time to, uh, if it's not an immediate news piece. Gabriella, you mentioned um, to me when we were preparing for this that you talked about science not really being an issue for the media in Guatemala. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the challenges of getting science into the media? Yes, like reinforcing what they say and also we were talking with Luis. Um, it's important to strengthen the, the not just the media but the, the formation, uh, formation academica from the, the people who do this, uh, this, the reporters and everyone who is going to publish there. But at the same time, um, why, media, why science is not because it doesn't sell? So no, I don't, under, I don't know any um, newspaper or maybe now with Twitter or whatever, other, other uh, kind of media, but who pays a reporter or something or, uh, to, to interview. Like they say only when there's a fire or something, and yet we are not the experts. They do many, many, many sources until they reach the ones who are in the country. So this is something that has to, this is a challenge, you know, just for the, for the uh, local uh, people who do the journalism, but also for us, because they come at the end, and they, are, they, they have so many biased sources that at the end they don't believe in what you are saying. So for me, it was important uh, knowing in this area, like strengthen, but also uh, expose people as well.
to see that there are advances, locally advances, that there are people doing science in our countries and not just the imported uh, North uh, scientific things. So I think it's a, it's a challenge to find a way that our own science is uh, given respect and um, but also like a balance, like they say, you know, like both things are good, but at, to some extent. Louisa, do you think media understands some of these issues, or do you think how far do you think it's got to go? I think that uh, we need to look to both sides, uh, not only because uh, sometimes the scientific community, some people in the scientific community, thinks that uh, it's, uh, the media needs to understand more uh, the scientific community. But it's the both sides. I mean, to, that also uh, the scientific community need to understand the journalist agenda, the media agenda, and uh, like the. The, if, if someone doesn't uh, do not answer our request, we need to, to go to someone else. We cannot wait like two months uh, to have a, 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 an interview. And so I think that uh, it's very good. We, we have been doing a lot of training and meeting, trying to put both scientists and journalists together and understanding uh, the difference and convergence uh, of science and media and uh, prepare both sides to have a much more dialogue. I think that uh, a lot of scientists also think that uh, is, uh, um, media needs to go to them. And uh, what we think is that it's much really important to have a dialogue uh, in the society, including media and uh, scientists. So it's good that we're here. <laughs> um, I just want to turn to the, the notion of visibility for, for women as spokespeople. and. Um, at the risk of doing a bit of self-publicity, you know, things like our awards that we've given you and things like that. How, how do those moments lift you and help you to get heard um, and really then embrace media and the opportunities? Does, do they bring opportunities, these sorts of awards and things, or do they, um, do they fly past really quickly? I mean, Carlo, have you found it's given you opportunities, having awards and recognition, and how's it affected things? Oh, yes. First, I had to be ready to to respond to the call, <laughs> to decide to participate and postulate for this open call, which was a kind of evaluation for uh, the contributions that I have done during the last years, during the last 10 years that I am in my country. So after the announce of the of the word, I was, um, I was well, it was interesting actually, because it was announced and viralized quickly through Twitter, through LinkedIn, and I was contacted by other um, scientists from my area and from other countries also doing the same work to start to establish a collaboration or to write uh, proposals together. So it opened up the opportunity to, to make even stronger teams and more solid teams and now international ones. I was also, um, mm, with the visibility, I was contacted by other universities trying to ask me to participate in other courses and programs. So I believe a nice future now going out of my own university in Bolivia and now collaborating with others from the system. Um, but the most important um, in the world, more than the world itself, is the visibility actually. <clears throat> and not only my visibility, but the visibility of my team, of other young women that work with me and have been working with me for the last 10 years, but also um, the visibility for my university and, and for my country. So it, it, was, it was very important and it was, has been so far so positive for me, but so challenging as well because we have to be ready to, to give an interview. It's something that we try to avoid, <laughs> being scientists in my country. And uh, yeah, but with nice of uh, coaching experiences that I'm having, like, like this conference, no? So it has a great impact. It's, it sounds, in, um, and you've mentioned a couple of times about the university's role in this, and it sounds like there's something in preparation that we could all do, universities, media, and so on, to help women scientists to be able to be equipped. So when you get an award like this, you're ready. Um, what's your experience been, Magali? Well, I think visibility is key because, I mean, if you go to the media, it's power. It's power that you have. You are like a referent. 
Even though you are not the expert, you are the referent and the person who knows more about that topic. That's what people think, actually. That is what I have found. So visibility is key to position uh, female scientists, and I think the work that Elsevier has done is super great. I received the award in 2016, and I remember we had a video of the, um, of the winners. We have a press release in English. However, at that time, I didn't have experience with the media in Spanish, so it appeared only on my university website that nobody probably, or oh, few people read. So, but I will say now, uh, and the work that they are doing is stronger because you can go, if you go to a press release in your country and you have several appearances in TV, and that is also an important work that the university has to do to promote the work of the people who work at, at their own setting, it's very important. Thank you. Gabriela, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I think um, I got the, the prize this year, and I'm very honored and thank, grateful. And like I said, I think I was joking, like when I said, I was like, I'm going to leave my two minutes of fame. Because suddenly, like, boom, I was like, interview, now not anymore. But it, like, the, there, right? So I was like, yes, 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 I have to, I have to figure. And something, um, maybe some Mexicans are here, and they know that like, Malinchista effect which is like, we believe that always the, the foreigner is better than no local. And it's what the, the case, you know, when it's international, it has like more weight than if I get recognition from other institutions that I've been. So for me, it was very interesting and, and nice to have this acknowledgement. And then they say this world price. And I was like, no, it's developing. but. I said, okay, I'm not going to correct them. They, they, they think that it's a work uh, because this gives more weight. So um, for me, it's, uh, right now, the opportunity as well. And I think it's part or it's the, the media, or the, it's, they know how to write exact words that we are not prepared sometimes to translate into other, you know, like to the, to the different uh, audiences. And for me, it, was, it would be very, it would be great if I can have a talk with the governmental, like, um, or the one who make decision, the decision makers. Because now, right now, uh, we have this uh, price, which is on food security and hunger. It's huge. So we need to be in the national agenda. And I want to be prepared, but I think with media, we can have this um, good match because they can translate exactly what I want to say in the words that are polite. So thinking about solutions then, that's, we've got all these big pressing problems with the Sustainable Development Goals outlining them. Um, Louisa, wh where do you think we can begin on, on creating solutions? I mean, has SIDEV looked at possibility of quotas and things like that? Or what, what's your view on where we can begin to make a difference? I think that uh, we every day we think about that, and uh, so I think that uh, covering a story, having our gender as one of the aspect that, of the story, I think that's very important. So this is something which is part of our everyday life since uh, many years. So uh, and I think that if we can sensitize other media to also uh, consider that. So tomorrow I'm going to present some results of a survey with uh, journalists, science journalists around the globe, and we will see that uh, in that specific aspect, uh, many science journalists do not consider gender when they are going to interview uh, someone. So I think that if we can sensitize uh, journalists uh, that gender is important for many reasons, for media, for society, for science, I think that uh, it's very important. And also I think that we can create more space in, in the media for a woman having voice. So for example, this partnership that we had in Sevier and SIDEV uh, having a space for women uh, uh, there. So I think that's very important too. Magali, do you want to add to that? Yes, so I want to add that meetings like this are very important. Like th this is the first time I attained a World Conference of Science Journalism. And I just, before this, before coming to this panel, I met with Fabiola, who is the head of Salud con Lupa, which is a very important um, journal in Peru. And she told me, Dr. Blas, why don't we apply for a grant uh, for a funding agency, USAID, to put that ta in the table indigenous health in Peru. So I think it's great. It's, it's great that we, as a scientist, can collaborate with journalists 
I mean, because we are looking for the same objective, right? I mean, which is to improve the health access of people. Yes, Carla, please do. I believe that also it's very important the presence of the, of the reporters while we are working in the indigenous communities. Because it gives us also some status there. I remember last year I was working in the south part of Bolivia in Potosí, and we have been there several times uh, with the students, with other professors, and uh, doing some training on these communities. But just one, once we went with the um, reporters from our university, then we, were, we had credibility by the indigenous communities. So they seen there's a reporter there um, recording all what is doing, what is going on there, and they compromise with their activities, and they trust. It gave us it gave us trustability in uh, that opportunity. So uh, I think we it's very important we make teams. Um, problems are not solved by, like in my case, in the lab. <laughs> uh, problems are solved by interdisciplinary teams, and a member of that team has to be a reporter, has, has to be a com communicator. And uh, that will not just show what we are doing, but we can achieve things faster by doing a good communication of that, even at the level of the um, decisions makers. Being there with, with a reporter, with a, a communicator, it, it's so important, no? And also with the media and the cameras and all, because that gives credibility to, to our context. Hmm? So because you've got the credibility, it makes sense for journalists to have really long-term relationships with scientists that, that can then build that trust with communities exactly. and, yeah, yeah. I mean that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Louisa, do you have anything to add to that? Is that realistic about media um, having long-term relationships with scientists? Is that... This is one of the questions that we added in the right. survey that I'm going to present the results I'll tomorrow. I'll let you do tomorrow. Yeah, so I invite <laughs> people to go tomorrow and then we can discuss this. Because uh, obviously there is an issue of creating trust, mm. uh, but also uh, if we think of science journalists being a more critical than just promoting science, then this kind of relationship is a, a question mark. So I'm not saying that should not exist, but it's something that we need to think mm. about. Because mm. you've got to have that independence still, and yeah, yeah it's exactly, very difficult. Exactly. Yeah. So just to sort of round off the conversation, um, I was wondering what your experiences have told you about, so in terms of over the years, if you could, if you were at 21 now. I am 21. Okay. <laughs> Being 21, <laughs> what advice do you give yourself for the future, knowing what you know now, and as a woman working in science and working with media and having had the visibility of the awards and grants and things, what would you tell yourself at 21 to help you prepare? Well, I will train myself on, well, of course, I will set aside all the training that you need to do, right? The MPA, the PhD, of course, we take that for granted. But I will say, learn about the use of social networks. Like, I didn't thought that it was too important, but it is very important. So basically, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, if you're getting to a younger audience. Um, Maybe have a website that displays your work that is updated, because sometimes media look for that, and if it's not updated, then, well, they don't care too much. And I will say have more contact, and I actually, I didn't appreciate that enough um, with the media. So I, I didn't realize the importance of that until my mom understood what I was doing. No? So my mom didn't understand. So I am a medical doctor, but I work in the field, in, doing public health. I'm a mom, or we said, Magali, why are, not you, why are you not seeing patients? Of course, I do public health. And I think when she saw that on my work in the media, she understood what I was doing. Um, and I will say that it's important I mean, for communication purposes. So I have as a, a better relationship with the media in the sense of you responding if they want something, of course, and asking, because it's a bi-directional relationship. Well, I'm 
okay, I'm 21. <laughs> and I would say to myself, uh, show your work. Do not wait until presenting your work or your results for an hour or for a contest. Do it uh, while you are developing the things. So that will show what you are really doing and that will show your contribution and perhaps you will have a better team, a bigger team that identifies with that and, and wants to make the same contributions. So I think this is so important to show what we are doing and we shouldn't wait until the call is coming. <laughs> difficult, difficult. When I was 21, I was exactly finishing my first degree on, on biomed engineering tech. So I was very idealistic and I wanted to solve, like design medical equipment. Then I was like, no, I don't like that. And I wanted, so then I was like, okay, I don't want to go back to Guatemala, I don't want to work, I just want to travel. So I wanted to work in a cruise, working in the kitchen, I don't know. Like. So I will say to that girl, you did a good choice, go for science. And don't change anything, and go forward. So that would be, that would be my recommendation. <laughs> You know, uh, in terms of profession, we are not talking about personal things, right? <laughs> so in terms of profession, I think that uh, I, I didn't have an a, um, obvious path because I, I was uh, thinking what kind of university degree I would like to have. I was thinking about science, but I didn't want to be like my father, working a, a single topic uh, his whole life. I wanted to see a lot of different things in science. And uh, so he actually was the one who suggested me to start working in science journalism, and I think that it fitted perfectly in what I wanted in my life. So I don't think that I would do differently. If we were talking personal, I think we'd be here a long time. So <laughs> thanks for sticking to the professional, everybody. <laughs> um, is there anybody in the audience that has a question for our panel before we um, conclude, by the way? Thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is uh, related to journalists trying to find female sources and uh, the issues that you describe, which I understand personally as someone that also has three children. Um, I'm wondering, what are your suggestions? How do we, how do we address that? Because uh, journalists do want to have gender balance in their stories, but it's, uh, it, it can be a real struggle. I would say that we need to start empowering female scientists no? because I think it starts there. So, and there are several issues around the deciding to do or not an interview. And I also I want to mention here the thing of humility that we have that is probably related to religion. In, for example, I am talking about Latin America, no? that they say, you, oh, you have to be humble. Uh, but you don't need to be humble <laughs> if you want to be visited. So I think some female scientists think that, oh, that it's not so good to appear a lot in the media because then I don't know the word in English, but people will say that you are like a creída or like you want to show yourself. Uh, so I would say communicating to female your scientists, the importance of communicating the work. I think that we need training from the moment that we're in the university, not to, so if, I mean, if I would have been told, no, it's important to communicate to the media, I would have maybe started sooner. So I think it has to start by, by that. Also, uh, work that has to do with the university in establishing, for example, I mean, courses about communication, are key and the importance of communication to the public also, uh, media training, etc. And of course, as I said, we need also to work with the society because if we put the burden all on women, then it's difficult if you have to answer within one hour or two hours. Now maybe if media can give us a little bit more time, maybe you don't need to do the interview tomorrow morning, but tomorrow in the afternoon or have more time to react because you have to read, prepare yourself, etc. That will be great. And also it's great that, I don't know if male do that, but I, I know that men do that also. But if female reporters do things like looking for gender balance, I mean, that means a lot to us. I think we have a valuable resource, which is the Association of Women in Science. I will go like first 
to this network because they already have like disciplines and, and they know where to locate them and specifically. So I, would, I think the, the, the contact that they have with this organization, like they are in different countries. So this is like, would be like my first source to find specific, uh, whatever you want in science, you can find it. So it would be that. Actually, I would like to uh, give you back the, the question. I would like to know more why you struggle, because you don't have access to names of scientists, a female scientists, or because they don't answer your requests. What kind of struggle you have for having access to, to female uh, source? Um, so yeah, so often it is um, exactly what I think it was Magali that mentioned uh, that, you know, I might contact like five or six female scientists and they're all too busy to talk to me, but I contact male scientists and they're very often immediately available. Um, so I do, I use uh, the, the source, um, it's called 500 Women Scientists. It, it's a good source, but it tends to be, um, sometimes it's not specific enough. So my stories are, you know, I'm getting into the nitty gritty of a scientific issue. That's a good place to start, but it doesn't necessarily lead me to the expertise that I need, which can be very specific. So that's the, that's the challenge that I face. So I think I want also to mention that women, as female scientists, we put our bar very high. No? So if we are invited to talk about polio, like in Peru, we think that we need to be the experts in polio, but sometimes that is not the case. So that day is when training and empowering is important. Thank you. I think we're out of time, so I'm just going to sum up. I, we've heard some really interesting things about role models and really encouraging young people and making sure um, that they know that there are opportunities available to them, um, especially as young women. And also um, about um, journalists understanding the challenges that women face, but also about women scientists understanding the challenges that media face. <laughs> um, and I just think there's some really interesting work to be done, perhaps in partnership with female scientists and media training um, in early career um, and science. And um, also that um, media should cover some of those that are learning at the beginning of their careers, because there's some exploratory media coverage that could be done there that would be interesting. And that would help grow those relationships that then help give journalists access to the work that you're doing. Um, and that could be really useful to, to the journalist community. So um, I think all that remains for me to do is to thank the panel. So um, Magali, Carla, Gabriella and Louisa, and thank you for giving your time and traveling here to the conference and thank you for listening. <laughs>